Hey, what's up, explorers? Thanks for tuning into this latest video today. I'm gonna to be focusing on some California travel news, specifically something that's been a controversial topic here for the last 10 years. So sit back, relax, and enjoy because this train is about to leave the station. <laughs> So just this last February 2019, newly elected Governor Gavin Newsom, in his first State of the State address, announced that he was putting the brakes on a massive statewide infrastructure project passed by voters in 2008, and that was to connect Southern California to Northern California with a high-speed rail system. Now, if you're not too familiar with high-speed rail in California, in this video, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the timeline of where we came from and where we're at today with the project, some of the controversy along the way and what the future might hold for the project. Now this was a huge announcement by Governor Newsom seeing that his predecessor Governor Jerry Brown had made high speed rail in California a major pet project of his, even going back as far as his first two terms as California governor from 1975 to 1983. In fact during that time Governor Brown signed two bills into law that would authorize the study of high speed rail in the state and he even advocated for a system during his 19 1992 presidential campaign. Well, in 1991, then President George H.W. Bush signed into law what was called the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991. And basically what that was was a new way of looking at transportation planning here in the United States. Um, it mainly focused on highways and interstates, but one thing it did do was establish five high-speed rail corridors throughout the continent, one of them being San Diego to Los Angeles to San Francisco. So this kind of just further fueled the fire of Governor Brown in California, and it paved the way for the formation of the California High-Speed Rail Authority in 1996. And the California High-Speed Rail Authority is a state agency that was initially tasked with coming up with a viable plan for high-speed rail and pitching it to the California voters. Well, they tried to get an initiative on the ballot in 1998, but after some funding debates, it got pushed all the way back to 2008. And finally, in 2008, we end up with something called Proposition 1A, or as it was formally titled, the Safe, Reliable, High-Speed Passenger Train Bond Act for the 21st Century. Now, I'm kind of a nerd and I found the original voter guide from 2008 and I wanted to read more about Prop 1A. Um, and what Proposition 1A did was propose an important question to California voters, and that is, should we build this thing? Now, at the time, the Office of the Legislative Analyst estimated a total price tag of $45 billion. And what Prop 1A would do is allow the state to raise $9.95 billion in state obligation bonds, with the rest coming from federal and matching private funds. Now, Proposition 1A also offered several guarantees to the California voter, um, one being that the train would have to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco with sustained speeds of at least 200 miles per hour, there would be reduced air pollution, less congestion, and one big one that the maximum travel time for that route would have to be no more than 2 hours and 40 minutes. Well, on November 4, 2008, Californians voted to pass Proposition 1A. 52.6% said yes, 47.4% said no, and then this is something I found interesting. Actually, 7.6% of the vote was invalid or blank. So it's kind of interesting to note that had those votes might have counted, the vote very well could have swayed in another direction. So Proposition 1A passes. Well, that's the easy part. Then comes the hard part. What happens after passage? Well, first, you need to realize that in California, we have something called the California Environmental Quality Act. And what that does is it allows any individual or organization to file a lawsuit against the project if they feel that that project violates the state's Air Quality Act. So immediately, you have six lawsuits filed against the initial portion of the high-speed rail route in the Central Valley alone. And then in 2010, the Obama administration issued almost $3.5 billion in federally provided funds for the project. Well, in 2013, Judge Michael Kenney of the Sacramento Superior Court finally rules on some of those initial lawsuits, and he finds that the California High-Speed Rail Authority basically violated provisions of Proposition 1A. 
today, specifically in regards to funding. You see, at the time, the California High Speed Rail Authority had identified potential sources of revenue for the project, but Proposition 1A was very clear that federal and matching private funds had to first be identified before a single dollar of state bond money could be spent on the project. So in response, in 2014, Governor Jerry Brown allocates 25% of revenue from the state's cap and trade program to high speed rail. And what the cap and trade program is in California is basically a Governor Schwarzenegger era program that placed a cap on the amount of emissions that organizations could emit into the atmosphere and created a competitive bidding process if they needed more allocations. I might have gotten that wrong, but if I did, correct me in the comments, but I think I'm right. Finally, in 2015, after seven long years, we break ground on the project and construction begins in the Central Valley on the initial portion of the route from Fresno to Madera. Well, then in 2018, Carl DeMaio, the former San Diego City Councilman, now Chairman of Reform California, proposes a ballot initiative to withdraw funding from High Speed Rail altogether, and that may appear on the 2020 ballot. And then finally, in February 2019, as I mentioned earlier, Governor Newsom announced that he was putting the brakes on the project, citing a lack of direction and funding. However, he did say that the initial portion of the route would continue from Fresno to Madera. So this had a lot of people criticizing the governor that the project was becoming a train to nowhere. Well, the day after Governor Newsom's State of the State address, his spokesman came out and basically retracted the governor's statement and said that they were only putting the brakes on the project for now, and that the LA to San Francisco route may continue at a later date once funding is identified. And this was exactly the opposition's point published in the 2008 voter guide when they said that the project may become a massive boondoggle and may never be completed. Well, word gets to Washington the day after Governor Newsom's State of the State address, and President Trump furiously demands California return almost a billion dollars in federally provided grant funds now that Governor Newsom basically changed the scope of the project. Well, of course, Governor Newsom promptly declines that demand. Well, now that we have some timeline of high speed rail in California, let's look at some of the controversy that came up along the way. Well, in its early days, the California High Speed Rail Authority paid almost $666 million to a firm called Parsons Brinkerhoff for engineering consulting on the project. Well, in a state audit report, it recently came out that Parsons Brinkerhoff never finished 145 out of 184 tasks it was asked to complete. Now, I don't know about you, but if I don't do my job at work, I'm probably not going to get paid, or worse, I'm going to get fired. And then in 2013, a $1 billion contract was awarded to the construction firm Tudor Perini to build the initial phase of the project in the Central Valley. Well, shortly after the contract was awarded, it came out that Senator Dianne Feinstein's billionaire husband may have had ties to Tudor Perini. So thus came accusations of bribery and kickback. Well, it turns out that Dianne Feinstein's husband did have ties to Tudor Perini at one point, but he divested all his shares of stock in the company well before the contract was awarded. Well, it did turn out that Tudor Perini had the lowest bid and lowest technical score of five contractors who placed bids on the project, so it had people questioning the reliability and safety of the firm. And then there's the undeniable fact that the original opponents of High Speed Rail basically predicted the situation we're in today. Back in 2008, they cited High Speed Rail as a potential government boondoggle with potential cost overruns and no guarantee of a completion. Over the years, the estimated price tag of this project went from $45 billion when originally presented to voters in 2008 to almost $100 billion just last year. In 2008, opponents argued that instead of building a high-speed train, we should instead focus on expanding our existing transportation systems, like building new roads and expanding freeways. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, go look at a Google traffic map of the 5 freeway through the Central Valley during rush hour. It's wide open. No one is trying to get from LA to San Francisco during rush hour. Traffic is all an inner city problem of people trying to get to and from work, so building a train from LA to San Francisco Francisco is not going to improve traffic. 
Oh, and let's not forget that in its 2012 business plan publication, the California High Speed Rail Authority conceded that the train may not end up going the sustained 200 plus miles per hour as originally promised to voters. Instead, they'd have to use a blended rail approach where they combined high speed rail with existing commuter lines so the train wouldn't go as fast as promised to voters. And then there's the fact that there's been three leadership changes at the High Speed Rail Authority in the last eight years alone. From 1997 to 2010, we started out with this guy named Mehdi Morshed from the State Department of Transportation. But it's important to point out that not a single foot of track was laid during his leadership. And then from 2010 to, to the present, we've had three CEO changes. So it had many questioning why can't we keep a CEO? Is this thing being mismanaged? And then finally, there's the fact that California has a terrible track record of managing massive infrastructure projects. After the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake damaged a portion of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, the state of California told voters it needed roughly $250 million to retrofit the bridge. Well, 20 years and $6.5 billion later, the bridge was finally completed. Now, that's a big oops to chalk up to a simple accounting error. So you have a combination of out of control spending, leadership issues, no estimated completion, and a project scope that's gone way beyond what Californians voted on in 2008. So where do we go from here? Do we continue on with the project or do we let it fizzle out and die? You know, one thing I find interesting is that the California High Speed Rail Authority constantly likes to compare the US to China and European countries that already have high speed rail. In fact, in its 2018 business plan publication, the rail authorities uh, stated that China has 16,695,000 miles of high speed rail track, whereas the US only has 34 miles of track. However, the Financial Times pointed out that China's high speed rail system is funded by unsustainable government subsidies and that debt bubble may soon burst. So could this be a potential warning sign for California that if we continue on with the project, we'll just end up more and more in debt with nothing to show for it? Before you go, I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think we should do? Should we continue on with the project or should we cut our losses and focus our time and money on things that really do need our attention right now, like homelessness or the housing crisis or building new water aqueducts across the state? Leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts. In the meantime, thanks for stopping by and remember to never stop exploring. <laughs>